Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, hundreds are killed in Ethiopia in the country's deadliest recorded landslide. The death toll is at least 229, but many are still missing. Also, in the wake of over six weeks of anti-government protests in Kenya, scores of people are arrested in neighbouring Uganda as police crack down on opposition MPs and young people who defied a ban and marched on parliament and against state corruption there. And Washington announces its own attempt to get Sudan's warring parties to the table to try and negotiate an end to the devastating conflict. I hear from one of Sudan's analysts about why a multitude of mediation attempts so far have failed. But first, the desperate search for survivors of a landslide in southern Ethiopia continued on Tuesday. At least 229 were killed in Kencho Shacha Godzi when the disaster, the deadliest of its kind ever recorded in the country, swept away all in its path on Monday. Nora Bershtaka with more. Gathered at the site of the tragedy, crowds of locals could only look on in anguish as rescuers desperately tried to search for survivors. Digging with shovels or their bare hands, they were putting their own lives at risk. Earlier in the day, rescue efforts had taken a turn for the worse after locals who rushed to help were buried by a second landslide. Initially, it was three families that were buried by the landslide. We're still searching for bodies, but the death toll surged after the people who came to rescue also got trapped. Over 200 people were killed, making it the deadliest landslide in the country's history. The tragedy took place in a remote mountainous area in southern Ethiopia, a region regularly affected by heavy rains, flooding and landslides, that often result in mass displacements and casualties. Well, police and soldiers fanned out across Kampala on Tuesday to clamp down on a planned march to parliament by protesters demo demonstrating against high-level corruption. The rallies had been banned, but inspired by Kenya's youth-led anti-government protests, some defiant Ugandans tried to walk the route anyway. Our team reports. This Tuesday, a small groups of young protesters attempted to organize an anti-corruption march to the Ugandan parliament in Kampala. The uh, security forces, including soldiers and plainclothes police officers, mobilized by the hundreds to block the city center and uh, prevent gatherings. Dozens of people were arrested and many Ugandans uh, refrained from participating, fearing violence, which local police are uh, regularly accused of at the end of 2020 at least. 54 people were killed during protests. Uh, since then, many have shied away from large gatherings, uh, wary of potential brutality. The uh, young organizers, inspired by the Kenyan movement, accuse the political class of corruption and demand the uh, resig resignation of the Speaker of Parliament, implicated in several embezzlement cases. They are one East Africa. Their blood is our blood. Their protests have given us the courage to come out and stand for our rights as well. The youths in both countries, in both Kenya and Uganda, share similar problems. So there has been um, cohesive um, inspiration. So we've drawn inspiration from the Kenyans because their problems are similar to ours. The uh, protesters also want to reduce the number of MPs, currently over 500, and are calling for audits of their uh, lifestyles deemed too luxurious. The MPs were resuming their activities this Tuesday after a break. A few of them uh, called for the protests to be authorized. Some uh, main opposition figures, including Bobby Wine, uh, did not take part in the rally. Three deputies from Wine's party were arrested uh, the day before the protest and are still detained. Well, in Kenya, the youth-led demonstrations sending ripples across the region have continued into their sixth week. When they began, they targeted planned tax hikes that were eventually rolled back. But demonstrators continue to up the ante, calling for President William Ruto's exit and denouncing institutional graft and police brutality. Olivia Bezo brings us more from Nairobi. Protesters had planned to close all roads leading to the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport and cause a total shutdown of Nairobi. Posters about these protests had been widely shared on social media. 
However, once again, police made any form of demonstration almost impossible. Throughout the day, they consistently fired tear gas, rubber and even live bullets every time a group of people tried to gather. Earlier, I spoke to protesters in Nairobi's central business district. We are getting free tear gas. We are getting free rubber bullets instead of getting free education. Instead of getting food. Yes, we are fearless. We are leaderless. Raila! We want justice. We want accountability. We need accountability in our country. Here in Nairobi, things are very difficult. The police have been attacking us even though we weren't causing any problems. We were just trying to have a peaceful protest, but every day that we come to the streets, we are getting killed. Protests began six weeks ago against planned tax hikes. President William Ruto has since withdrawn that contested finance bill, but demonstrations have continued despite the huge amounts of police brutality. Four officers are currently facing prosecution over the shooting and killing of protesters. More than 50 people have been killed so far, dozens of people have been abducted and hundreds arrested. Now, this week, aid group MSF described Sudan as the site of the world's most significant humanitarian crisis. Both the Sudanese army and the RSF paramilitary have been accused of atrocities since they began battling last April. Tens of thousands have been killed, over 10 million forced from their homes by devastating conflict. On Tuesday, the US said that it had invited Sudan's combatants to ceasefire talks in Switzerland due to be held in August. Now, they'll be the latest in a long line of international attempts at mediating peace. But the prospect of that seems no closer. I'm joined now by Omar Digna, a Sudanese analyst and author of the book Governance and Human Nature. Omar, first of all, you know, Addis, Geneva, Cairo, Jeddah, the African Union, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Today we're hearing Washington. We've seen this dizzying array of attempted peace talks. Um, uh, why so many? And do you see any of them having an impact? OK, um, first, we need to describe the war in Sudan, because I, I don't think that the media describes it well as uh, the way it is. Uh, I believe it's a colonial war against Sudan. It's waged uh, by the uh, UAE and its allies to take over Sudan for its resources. Uh, and uh, and for po uh, political influence too, uh, just like what they did in Yemen and Libya, parts of Li parts of Libya and uh, all of Yemen. So uh, and they succeeded to promote uh, the uh, the war as uh, the two generals war, equality war, uh, war against the former regime, and uh, none of that is true. It's cla uh, classic uh, colonization tactics. Is uh, just uh, have a different rhetoric for your uh, for your real uh, uh, purposes for the war so uh, so the war in sudan is a war between the uae and the people of sudan the way yes. so uh, back to your question if you think um, if you're asking if the, the talks are going to be any good uh, no uh, unless the uae uh, gives up on on its dreams uh, of taking over, uh, over sudan uh, I don't think the the, the talks will, will go anywhere because. Uh, Omar, you're going uh, to the, have to the, you, you're going to have to mm -hmm. really break this down because the combatants are the Sudanese mm -hmm. army and we have the RSF yeah. paramilitary. Why are you yes. focusing so much mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. UAE when one, we're looking at our fighters from two very domestic military forces? No, they're not domestic. Uh, they they of sure have. Uh, uh, ties with uh, with uh, regional powers, uh, namely the UAE, so at some point uh, other countries too. So uh, what they uh, what happened in uh, in Yemen, for example, was uh, was not a war that, that concerned Sudan, but uh, the, the 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 RSF and the SAF took part in the war uh, uh, as part of their uh, the uh, the direct ties between them and the United Arab and the United Arab Emirates. So no, it's not a war between uh, two generals because uh, those two generals uh, would have never had this war uh, w wasn't for uh, for the uh, regional influence over them. Mm -hmm. so that's and the and how does that affect 
um, the mm -hmm. the international and regional efforts, external diplomatic efforts, to try and find some kind of negotiated solution to Sudan's conflict? Yeah, uh, if they want to find a solution, they'll have to uh, go uh, directly to the source of the problem, uh, which is uh, the, the, the hopes of the United Arab Emirates to take over Sudan for its uh, seaport, just like they did in uh, Bab al-Mandab uh, uh, in Yemen. Uh, now they, they, they're there, they, 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 they control it, not, not the Yemeni government, and this is what they want to do in uh, in, uh, in Port Sudan, and um, uh, plus the other resources like gold. Of course, everybody knows that uh, the Sudanese gold uh, pours into the United Arab Emirates, and uh, some go to other places like uh, Russia, maybe. But the main destination is the United Arab Emirates. So they they are they are fighting this war to, for the resources and political influence. They want political influence in the Horn of Africa. And on the uh, on the Red Sea, so that, that that's uh, that's a real description of the war. So uh, when you're talking about, uh, of course, of course, you have to have a different rhetoric for it because, like, we're fighting the uh, former regime, we're fighting for democracy, whatever. So, uh, but nobody is buying it. No, nobody is buying it. Uh, the people of Sudan uh, demonstrated against the former regime and they ousted it and they they hated it and they did everything. But now in this war. Most of the Sudanese people are with the uh, Sudanese armed forces that is allegedly uh, being supported by the former regime because people now have to choose between uh, between falling uh, into uh, the, the hands of foreign powers or uh, support the, uh, the, the, the regime that they hated for so long. But at least that's a Sudanese regime. It's a national regime that we can uh, we can tackle later on. But we cannot tackle uh, a colony, a colonization. So you don't see much hope for any of these externally organized or mediated talks to try and find some kind of, of settlement between the army and the RSF? No, no, I don't think, I don't think uh, any breakthrough, a real breakthrough is going to happen in, in, the, in those talks because, um, because uh, people are still, still hoping to uh, win power. Uh, Takadum uh, coalition, which is sadly has become uh, echo for uh, for uh, UAE in Sudan. Oh, they were once uh, beacons of hope, uh, change, and uh, and democracy. Uh, everybody supported them uh, back in uh, 2019, 2020. But now uh, they, they they have no say. They have no say. They have no weight. They chose to lose their weight for uh, quick gains. So they chose to uh, to follow the RSF to be to be their political wing. As people say, they hate this word, but that's sadly the truth. Uh, both the RSF, RSF and uh, and Tokadum are, are 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 tools in the hands of the UAE. Um, even even some of the former uh, I have to mention this uh, some of the former uh -huh. members. Yes, uh, the former members of the uh, of those uh, of FFC uh, are opposing it right now because. Uh, because they know it's, it's, it's unethical, the stance they're taking. Omar Digna, thanks very much uh, for giving his take on some of the behind-the-scenes drivers of Sudan's uh, war that erupted last April between the RSF and the Sudanese army. Well, that is, though, all we have time for for Iron Africa. Thanks very much for joining us. Do so again. Till then, take care.